today's presentation is about uh, Svelte uh, and also but Svelte in the context of inclusive development. So um, what, I, I, what I will uh, show you today, so there is more or less one hour. So I will try to go quickly through some of aspects of Svelte, which is uh, a framework. You, most of you must have at least heard about it. And then why we uh, choose it into the context of uh, uh, inclusive development project. And it's, uh, there is a lot of aspects, so I will try to reserve some time at the end to not speak too much. So you can feel free to ask me anything, and maybe I can show you directly how it works or can answer some questions to make something a bit more alive. Okay, so uh, yes, let's start and we will dive into the subject. So what is Svelte? Uh, Yes, you know, in the JavaScript world, there is a lot of fancy and uh, there is a lot of new things happening every day, every week, new frameworks. And Svelte is like the new kid on the block. So uh, it's really the recent framework, which came after the big framework you, we all know, Angular and React and Vue. This comes very lately, so it's something that is the project has three years old, but the last version with the last concept is only uh, one year and a half old. So uh, it's really something new and it brings on the table uh, some brand new concepts, which are very interesting. Um, yes, so by definition, what is valid and what it's not. So, it's definitely a component framework. So a component framework is a tool that lets you display on screen some components. Components is a, uh, a piece of, uh, of uh, application, a piece of screen that you can uh, reuse. And um, Svelte is a tool, is a framework that lets you display and manage those components on screen. So, it's really based on the concept of component. Everything you do will be a component. But how it works, it's not a runtime framework as we used to, to use. Like uh, some days ago, some times ago, there was jQuery. So you add jQuery into your browser, you add a script, then it adds some features to your context that you can use to uh, have new functions. Same for React. Same for Angular, you add it in your browser, so you load it the library, and then it gives you some uh, features that you can use uh, to render uh, application, to manage states, or things like that. But Svelte works a bit differently. It's a language, so it will define like another language, uh, CoffeeScript, uh, I don't uh, ELM. Uh, TypeScript, it's a different language. So it's not JavaScript, it's a different language. And a compiler. So this is what is that. It's a language, it defines how you should write the application and the compiler that would let you compile the application to um, a web application. So it's uh, compile, It's for the web. Um, there is some, uh, uh, for example, there is a Svelte GL to compile to WebGL, there is a Svelte native to compile to compile to native um, to native uh, mobile application. Like uh, it uses native script. So, uh, but yes, the base framework is a compiler for web application. How it works under the hood? Um, as I said, there is no runtime, and you write components. So a component is a file. A file called Svelte. So there is this new a file extension, dot Svelte. You create a component, and you write this component. Then you have to compile it. So it doesn't work as is on the web browser. You have to compile it. So uh, you can, by default, the Svelte compiler is just a node module that you can use. Uh, you can use directly. So you call it, you give it the source, it gives you an output. But you know, there is modules also for rollup web, webpack. I think for parcel also. Um, so um, there is, a, but 
uh, what it does is just call the compiler. So you call the compiler, and the compiler will build this uh, slide component into a JavaScript file. So it's the main target, a JavaScript file. Um, you can optionally have the style inside the JavaScript, like you used to do with Webpack or Rollup. You bundle everything inside JavaScript, and it's loaded by adding a style tag. Or you can decide to compile the style of your component into a dedicated style sheet. So it depends on your uh, on your uh, optimization strategy. I, I would say uh, something interesting. I think it's more marketing than anything else. Um, but people were a bit. Uh, it was unusual nowadays. It doesn't use virtual DOM. So. Uh, the compiled version of Svelte has use other techniques than virtual DOM to render a component on, uh, on a web page. So we can go back to this uh, if you want later. So now let's dive into some concepts of Svelte. Uh, we won't show them all because there is a lot. Uh, I've chosen a few that I think are very interesting. Uh, and the one I like too, because I'm here to also to talk about what I like. So um, yes, let's dive to some of the concepts. Um, yes, beyond the hype, we will see some of those concepts. One screen rule. So very important in Svelte. It has been also, there is a lot of effort which have been made in the developer experience. So as a developer, uh, how to I create an uh, application productively. And it's, incre um, it's incredible how very small things, very small details can change your day-to-day -day life. If you, like me, are spending more than eight hours a day um, doing some code, you, when you have some improvement in your experience with the code, then it improves your life too. So, um, First, uh, it's not new. Some other framework are using this rules also. It's the one screen rule. So you all know that. Uh, if you've been developing for uh, the web from a long time ago, you have to switch between uh, JavaScript, HTML, the um, CSS, and sometimes multiple files and, and also the rendering. So you have two, maybe sometimes two screens, one with the browser, one splitting in three with uh, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, like you can see in GSB or CodePen. So yes, Svelte brings it in as part of the developer experience. So I will start by that. What looks Svelte, um, what a Svelte file looks like? So it looks like um, um, a three parts, like you used to do. So it's also, one of the nice part of that, you're not um, um, you're not lost. So, if you don't know Svelte, you start looking at that. Okay, there is some script, let event. Maybe it's a variable, and I, I can bet it's about something that looks like JavaScript style. Also, it looks familiar to me. H1 color navy. Okay, looks like uh, CSS. There is a, a selector. There is a, a rule. And then something which with tags like HTML tag. Also, this there is uh, it's maybe I can guess it's a, it's a template system. So uh, I can show you in the Ripple. So the Ripple do the compilation in the background. So uh, you can write that application uh, very easily. So, but yes, you have some script a variable. The variable is replaced here. Here we go. So. As you see, it's very convenient because you have the three browsers of the web development uh, all together in the same room, like JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. And the good part, you will see, this CSS belongs to this HTML, and this scripting belongs to uh, the boss, so the DOM and the HTML. Of course, uh, if I change the variable, get another meetup. Uh, the, the text change, so it's, a, it's just a simple variable replacement. So one screen rule, variable replacement. 
uh, this just this improves the developer experience uh, then felt works on one principle um, it, it tries to remove any boilerplate code as much as possible there is still a bit to be honest so the author of that are aware of those uh, limitations but if you have to write the same thing three or four times maybe it's wrong by definition so uh, the goal of that is to be boilerplate free again as part of the developer experience you don't have to write the same thing twice so i can show you and i will also open that one in the repo uh, that one yes so um let's start uh, maybe i can increase the font if you want it will be better yes so let's start we have a variable called active which has the value false um just forget about that part right now so we have a call active with the value false. I have a style it yeah, and a class active. So I have I want to create a button and if the button can be active or not. So it's a class, two states. The button can have two different states. So to give the state active to the button, I can give the variable to this. So place active is, is active or I can say here true and here my two buttons are active uh, but I can use a variable this is the definition of my component called button now in another component uh, I can use the component called button and I want to control the active state so is it active yes or not I want to control it from the outside so by exporting this variable, we uh, allow to control it during the instantiation. So I can add one button, two button, three button, and if it's uh, and I can use or not the active property. So if I export it, it has the default value of false. Maybe I don't put a default value. It's false. It's false. It's false. No, I want to control if it's active. Active equal. Oh, sorry. Oh. And that one is active. Okay. Um, boilerplate free. It means here we have, even if it's not a lot of code, written some code that is unnecessary. So everything is valid. Here, this bracket lets you evaluate the variable. And we will add the class active only if the result of this expression is true so it's a class toggling system which is very smart um, you toggle the active class based on the result of an expression so if it's true the class uh, you can see inspect it this one has the class active i can increase uh, this one has the class active where the other don't so um, it's a toggling system for the class, very smart. So boilerplate free means maybe here we have something like I'm using the variable name and the variable name is repeated here. It's the same as the class. Let's remove that. And it still works because it does a matching based on the name. So this code, which is considered as repetitive, is a boilerplate code, so we remove it. Uh, of course, if we want to do something else, like uh, something very weird, like I will use the negation, like export that not active. You should not do that at home. Um, and you do a double negation. So if you want to, it's st it's it still works, but uh, you can use another. So. By default, if the properties are the same, then uh, the, here for a class toggler, then you can use it directly. Now, we see there is also this active, uh, which is exported as a property. And we have the, the same principle, net active equal true. If in the subcomponent we want to, we have the matching with, between the names 
and the properties, we don't need to reassign like the value active is active. We have also uh, a way to assign values without uh, remapping the name, and we can do that. Active, active. Uh, we have also possibilities to, if, for example, um, we have some objects and multiple properties. We can, of course, spread um, values. So here, active is spread as property. So this is pretty usual. But yes, it's based on the concept of uh, two very small things that improves your life. So by the way, I showed you how we have components which are using other components. Um, please just check. There is one constraint. You have to name your component is um, capital uh, later because uh, it's to different it from uh, usual HTML. So here I can add HTML and to differentiate HTML from uh, this field components. Uh, so this is convention, so it's a convention. Um, yes, one, uh, if we have to define Svelte also, we can say it's a reactive framework. So uh, reactivity is really uh, in the heart of the, uh, of the framework. And it's done by design. So, um, and again, I think they have found a pretty smart way to handle reactivity. Uh, I will tell you it right now. Reactivity is handled by observables. So, so you have a way to observe variables, but uh, you can control what is observed. And if it's observed in one way or two ways, by very simple tricks, like declarative uh, tricks. Um, all the concept of Svelte is, okay, observables, there have been some tries to standardize it. Then to make a proposition to the core JavaScript language to add some reactivity, reactive statements, things like that, it will take something like 10, 20 years to have something part of the language. Well, maybe less, but uh, it's really unknown. So that try to do today what we should be able to do tomorrow with uh, a language. One of these uh, features is reactivity. How in our code, today in our code, we know we can manage asynchrony, uh, uh, asynchronous um, uh, uh, calls declaratively with uh, async await promises. Uh, but here we have the same principle like, okay, what if we can manage reactivity by the, uh, the syntax? Uh, I will also open that one in the repo. So reactivity means we want something that change based on something else. So very easily, I have a, it's a very uh, simple example. I have a temperature in Fahrenheit and I have a temperature in Celsius. So I'm doing the conversion using this, uh, this function. So uh, we pass the value. So we have temperature in Fahrenheit and temperature in Celsius. I want the temperature in Celsius to be changed as soon as the temperature in Fahrenheit changes. Uh, how does it work? So first of all, I will just do it that way for now. I have error in Celsius, um, which is right now calculated from the temperature in Fahrenheit. So it starts at 32. Here, I will even remove the binding. So I can do something like on change if and change uh, e event uh, let's say um, 
something like that. The put value. So yes, we will have something like that. So by the way, you see that I can handle uh, native events. You see the compiler, it's nice to have a compiler. So temperature Celsius. So here maybe I will get something, not a number, so cool. Um, yes, because this of the syntax. Still not a number, uh, maybe it's e dot. Um, maybe I can access temp. It's directly. And if I bring it, I think the calculation is not good. I did there is something wrong, maybe due to. But yes, what I tried to do first was to retrieve the value from the input value. If I bind it, if I use this uh, here, I can use it from the event. So it's one way to read the value from here and to apply it here. So that propose you to bind the values. So if I bind the value, it means as soon as I change it, I change the variable temperature Fahrenheit. If I do it in that way, the value is set only when I set the value from the variable, so from the variable to the input, it's set. If I bind it, it sets the value to the input, and if the input changes this value, the variable changes too. And here, since I'm tracking on change, once it has changed, I got the new value, then I can change it. But still, it doesn't feel very uh, it, very intuitive. So in Svelte, they have added the concept of reactive statement. And it's where all the smart system starts. When you need to have some re-evaluation of your uh, component tree, then you can, um, if it's only on one way, there is no issue. The compiler will analyze the path between your different components. And as soon, for example, if I have two components, if I change one variable, if this variable change in the subcomponent, it will render the part in the subcomponent that needs to be re-rendered. So it's a partial re-rendering. But if we need to have some reactivity, so some part of the screen that change when something else changes, uh, we need to uh, have a system to tell, okay, please observe this part of the code and check if it has changed. And if it has changed, please do that. So it's where they, uh, they introduce uh, this syntax. This syntax, dollar colon, is um, a syntax from uh, uh, JavaScript itself. So this is a label. It's called JavaScript label. So it's used the JavaScript label syntax, but the Svelte compiler will use it as what they call a reactive statement. So a reactive statement, when we will compile the code, it will create, it will parse and analyze this piece of code. So it can be a, a block. We can have some direct, um, I just need to, declare the variable, it will be, um, it will parse this block of code and check which variable are read. So uh, since it uses an IST, uh, you can very easily read, um, know which variables are used, are read. So here you will see, okay, this variable, which is in the context, is read. So I will, I, it will, it will add, at the at compile time, some decoration into the compiled code, into the final code, to observe it. So it will create an observer around it. And each time this, the value of this variable changes, it will evaluate a new time this block of code. So uh, 
uh, we can copy paste. And I don't know if this console will work, but yes. So here we have the first mount. The component is mounted. It will evaluate this once. And we have the value, the initial value as well here. Yeah. If I change once the value of this variable, thanks to the binding, 34, it will reevaluate this block of code. So each time this value change, know this one, maybe it's considered as read. So if this one change also, it will create, it will run it also. But as soon as one of the variable which is used inside this block will be read a new time, then it will uh, evaluate it a new time. And it's how it handles reactivity. There are other ways to handle reactivity, but um, you have ways to uh, do it in one way, give variables to the DOM. If the variable here is changed, the part of the DOM re-render automatically. But you can have also binding from DOM to variables, bind here, and you can have reactive statements. As soon as one the value of one variable change, we re-evaluate this expression. So it, it should be used only on purpose, only when you have parts which are reactive. Uh, but and using this compilation mechanism where there is an invalidation, there is an observable. So observable is invalidated. So the whole statement rerun again. And if one of the assigned value change and is in the component tree, then see part of the component tree um, re-render. Some smart parts uh, as well to also evaluate that only this will need to be re-rendered because this is the only part that contains the variable. Um, yes. So another very nice feature of Svelte is styling. So uh, it's maybe the, the framework which has stay style included. So if you uh, if you ever wonder why other framework doesn't care about styling, maybe for the separation of concerns, uh, it's understandable. You will see that when you the style is managed by the framework, it's also very, very nice. So how it works? Uh, as you saw, there is a script uh, for the JavaScript, and there is a style for the styling. So uh, it's not very fancy, but here you can um, define the style for your and only your component. And this is where it's very nice. Um, I've spent years in trying to make CSS nice. To be honest, uh, I'm not uh, the best CSS developers, but I've tried everything which I could to make CSS nice. From global CSS, uh, BEM, CSS OM, that, uh, there is class utils, a lot of stuff. Then semantic uh, selectors, Yes, I, I've tried a lot of techniques and I've very, very quickly found that um, there is there is different concepts like global cascading, which doesn't match 100% well um, atomic designs, for example, or you still have some possibly possible conflicts or the atomicity principle is sometimes broken or you have to be very, very careful and um, I don't say it's not possible, but here it, it, it offers you a way to manage it uh, out of the box. Um, so let's see how it works also. Yes, um, I'm, as you see, I'm very, I was very inspired. So uh, I have one component, which is called fashion warning. It has two class. You see that if a class highlight map to the property highlight, class outline map, and I've defined some very uh, style, uh, some styles which are not very proud of. So, but uh, it serves the purpose of the team. Uh, this component is called fashion warning, and I'm including it into another component. 
what you what you should uh, see there is something that you you should spot directly here i have something called p a tag called p um, i'm applying it some styles like uh, font family italic uh, some sizing i can um, maybe make it bigger make it even bigger yes so here i have my component it has this style to to em size to classes and it's in a p you see that i'm just uh, targeting the p okay and here i have another component which includes this component i'm also defining a p in my style so i'm not using a class if we look at the rendering yes it's so error we should focus only we just uh, increase the size yes so what it renders it renders the two p the first p svelte support styling p beware fashion included so sorry i was not very inspired so but in terms of style, I'm defining dark green on P, and here on P, I'm defining a, a font size. So if you do it in pure CSS, like if I merge those two style tags, I should end with my two, based on the uh, cascade priority, uh, uh, I should end with uh, either the two with two EM of uh, font size, uh, maybe one will override the value of the other but here Svelte handles for you at compilation time the scoping so uh, style from this part is completely scoped so it will and only apply to the DOM defined in your component how it does that it's pretty it's a very simple way it generates a class a unique identifier for your component and the generated style you see p dot svelte dash something which is the identifier and same for the other so there is no conflict of style between components like if i create a component with svelte i'm very confident uh, so is, there could be still some overrides because uh, it's a, it's uh, the priority so uh but by default i'm very confident that the style won't be overridden between my components so you still you have ways to work that around if you want to not do it of course you can still use still styles from the outside i don't know there are people that may use some frameworks uh, some um some outside um uh, style system and you can still apply uh, the style from uh, uh, i don't know there is very weird a framework that does uh, things like that the extender of I, I don't know uh, but it will work but if you define st style inside component it will stay applied to your component and it's very very nice so what it uh, it means also it means when you develop, you, I'm, I've stopped working with classes where it was not necessary. Like I'm using the semantic of the DOM uh, for my style. It means it's not a complex one, but for example, if I have some header, some main, some section, some aria uh, attributes, if I have some role, I can target based on the role and not based on a very uh, abstract class that use only for the styling i add only classes only if there is a purpose for adding a classes like the purpose of a class is classification if there is multiple uh, things that will look like that or of course if i have three p in my component and i want two of them to have the that one that's kind of style because it's uh, it's uh, uh, I, I can classify my p with uh, with classes but i will use classes for their initial purpose classification 
of the elements in the DOM. And for everything else, I use the semantic of the DOM uh, and CSS selectors. So there is, oh, most of the people don't know that, but there are other selectors than classes in CSS. Uh, so you can reuse CSS. Uh, I, I'm pretty happy with where, how the way it works. So, yes. Um, I will try to, to be a bit quicker. So yes, it has also a nice part. It, the state is included in state. So it proposes you a way to manage um, states. There is two state management, global state management, like you have a global state you can share across all your components or outside your application. And um, the good part, those states are observable in the same meaning that uh, RxJS observable, you can use RxJS observables in Svelte or your own observables as soon as um, they match the observable definition, which was proposal stage one at TC39. Like um, it needs to have a subscribe method, which returns a function to, to unsubscribe. Uh, it's that's it. So I have a dummy state. You have writable, readable, derived states, and there is method to subscribe to update on state change, set and get. States are global, and then I can reuse those states in my component. If I use a state, so an observable, an observable will be an object with a method subscribe, set, update. Uh, I, I can use it directly in Svelte using also, it's a syntax shortcut. If you have the dollar in front of the variable name, it will uh, subscribe to your observable, get the value and update your DOM based on the subscription to this observable. So uh, if you have already been using observables, um, you can right now see there is it's a huge improvement like into the component rendering, observable, you just subscribe, you don't really care of how it's handled, no boilerplate, just you get the value and your components uh, change with the value. So here, yes. I think I, it's not a good, yes. So um, here I have my observable. My observable has a subscribe, set, update. I have even defined my own method move, like I'm inviting it to move just to have a better API. So move, clicking on a button, will call the move method, which will call set, which is part of the observable. It will uh, give the new state. Then if the state change, if someone has subscribed to the state, uh, it will re receive a callback then, but this is done uh, for you at compile time. So here it will just change the value, which is here. So right, up, down, left. So you have another way to manage state in as well. You can have what they call context, which are states which are not global, global but states which are shared between um, a component tree. So it will be shared between one component and its subcomponent, for example. So it's also a way to have some states which are not shared to all support, but it's another uh, thing. Yes, um, I will show you after with felt size matters. Um, it has been, um, maybe, yes, maybe I will talk about it right now. So. So one of the ideas be behind Svelte was with um, what we call the modern framework, the frameworks that are used today, uh, there was some issues to target some users which had low-end uh, smartphones, some devices with not a lot of memories, and uh, the author of Svelte thought that, okay, there is what he called a local maximum. A local maximum is we use uh, a way, a technique, a mechanism, and we don't 
when we want to optimize, the only thing that we will do is try to optimize with that way. It's what has happened with virtual DOM. We figure out that virtual DOM was a very smart way to update a part of the DOM, but and then we try to think how we can optimize it to make it even faster to consume less memory. But still, there is uh, some minimal requirements for virtual DOM, like when you diff your virtual DOMs, which is, happens all the time, which creates a lot of entries in memories. And with using the virtual DOM, you have to, uh, to use those uh, constraints because it's part of the mechanism. Uh, and same for uh, the whole framework. If it's a runtime framework, you can reduce the runtime as much as possible. But uh, with React, you have Preact, you have a very small, um, uh, runtime, you can have a very small runtime, but still you have a runtime. With files, you don't. So once your component is compiled, it won't contain any line of code which won't be used by your component. So uh, even some internals, it will add them at the compile time for only for what it needs. So there is no svelte when you, I push to production my code. There is no svelte anymore. And that's why you have no uh, your original bundle size. So the bundle size is my minimal component size. If my component is two kilobytes, then my production bundle is two kilobytes. Then um, thanks to this invalidation mechanism provided by the compilation, I don't have any memory consumption because it just uh, use the DOM API invalidation mechanism, so we observe the change, invalidate only the part of the DOM that change, and there is no memory consumption. It scales with um, a, a lot of nodes. I, I don't have an idea of the exact scales, but um, uh, with thousands and thousands of nodes to update, you don't have any impact performance. Where it can change, it's where your code contains thousands of components in your component tree. So the tree is bigger and bigger, then the bundle size can increase a bit because you have the initial size of each component. How oh, I'm using Svelte for inclusive development. What I call inclusive development is uh, you develop for everybody. That's also the definition. Uh, for everybody, it means for uh, the user which doesn't speak English. It means for the user which uh, tests your application on a, a low-end device. It means your user that tests your application, that use your application with a 4K uh, uh, smart TV. It means the user that uh, have some troubles to uh, read your application. So everybody should be part of your target. Um, one of the big parts of it is internationalization and localization. So uh, it's not necessarily uh, only for Svelte. It works for every every uh, every kind of application. But I will show you what I found for Svelte. So one of the first parts when I try to dig into the topic, uh, one of the big topic was outside internationalization is easy, very easy. You replace the string by the translation. But localization starts to be more difficult when your target, it's inclusive, so you have to include everybody, is people from Japan, which read the text into other directions than you, people from the Arabic countries, which uh, read from right to left instead of the directional left to right. So uh, there is a proposal in CSS, which is start to be implemented in some engine, which is to I will show you quickly. We have this uh, new way to, instead of using this uh, cumbersome way with margin left, margin right. So if you right is right and left is left. So when you reverse or you mirror the user interface, then your definition of uh, variables stay at the same place. So instead of find new properties, which are called inline start, uh, based on start and end, padding uh, in line start, padding in line eight. Uh, but there is a small complication. You need to take into account 
that the start um, and the end can be also for the block direction, which is uh, uh, in that direction or in line direction. For Japanese, you inverse the block direction and the inline direction. So everything gets uh, reversed too. So it works very nicely for the text, but still for the layout, um, we keep using uh, uh, the directional attributes. And with Velt, we have one, uh, one small um, trick to use uh, contextual style. So I showed you that in your component, everything is scoped, but here we can rely on something outside. So we can rely on style which are outside of my component. Here I have a component which is either bar. I want it to be reversed. Um, I've used the old syntax to get margins. Margins is for layouting. So margin uh, more on the left and left less on the right. But when I will reverse my uh, user interface, I want to have this consistency, like this should be on the right and this should be on the left. Since it's everything is scoped, I have to use this a custom pseudo selector, it's uh, Svelte provides this custom pseudo selector to say, okay, if somewhere outside of this component, there is dear RTL, then apply this type. It's a very smart way also because it works for directional attributes, but it can work also for media queries. And for media queries like preferences, on uh, the theme, like dark and, uh, and light themes. It works also for uh, pr um, some browser preferences, like preferences without animations, fixed like, uh, fix like that. Uh, yes, oh, and one nice thing uh, about Svelte, it has accessibility uh, support built in. It's a compiler, so uh, it, it's easy to tell you when you develop that something is wrong. Uh, I've tried to do something as bad as possible. So uh, if you can spot how much issues there is into this code. So the nice part is, yes, yeah, uh, something that uh, moves and uh, I don't have the alt attribute, the role is wrong, href without anything is not valid. Um, there is a wrong tab index, there is um, an empty heading, there is some tags that should be avoided, and Svelte has a lot of rules already in the compiler. You can't, uh, it's only a warning, so I can still produce my component, but still Svelte will tell me, okay, your element command, uh, your image command, it should have an alt attribute. So it's so basic that you shouldn't have forget to it. And so I can still define it that way because it's the correct way to say that my image yeah, should be in yard. Then I can add some content, h1, and the role doesn't exist. Uh, uh, this is interesting. It's not a valid hash. Just the hash is not a valid attribute for href. So we can uh, give a proper anchor like uh, main title, yes, we work right there. Something that moves on the screen is on the go. So let's use um, something else. Um, this shouldn't be hidden. And last, Aria label by it's it's not the right it's not a good name so if I want to label by it's with two L and here I have something better and those little things makes the experience a bit more um, nice when you develop uh, this kind of application and last I have lost my presentation yes good last thing I I want to show you yes this concept of you are able to work for all devices is very, very nice because um, I have prepared a small health application. 
I will, I will uh, just compile it. Okay. Um, build. I'm using rollup to compile it uh, because I'm a rollup user, uh, but you can compile it with anything. It has, but I don't know, I think I have in source. Uh, yes, I will show you source app svelte. So I have a first component, which is the entry point component. App it has um, um, some layouts, and I have one inner component. So it's very, it's very, very small. So I have a few, a few style rules. I have another component, state management. Uh, there is no, once it's compiled, yes, I have this main JS file. Uh, I will do something. I will try to, uh, to beautify it. Um, oh, this is provided by Babel, so it's additional code. So I've used Babel. Um, I can try to look. Uh, new time. Yes, I think I have something. Oh, yes, it has been optimized out because, um, yes, I will show you that after anyway. So, because the compile code with that is readable. So, usually here I've optimized it. Um, usually it's really readable. So, you can even parse it, try to understand it, and to check where it fails. I will have it with uh, open it with some browser. Yes, this one. Okay, why not? Um, do that. I'm but waiting the lighthouse report. Um, something I can show you already is the footprint. So yes, here for my application, I have a bundle of 13 kilobytes, uh, CSS included, and that's it. Uh, we can check the memory, so I can even uh, work a bit with it. What do I have in memory? Uh, so yes, full memory, two mega mega octet, twelve uh, mega octet. Um, and I can check performances too. I sh I should stay at sixty FPS no matter what I do. So here it's just a guitar tuner, so I can select different strings. So yes, I, I'm, I'm keeping at 60 FPS. I don't know if the report, let's do it. Um, and let's say what it tells me. Lighthouse, I don't have the favicon, so. Yes, and that's always like that. Time to interact, 0 0.9 seconds. It's not very good, but uh, can be, there is no blocking time. And that's one of the best part of that. It's so small that you can ship, uh, yes, it's too bad. Um, you can ship application which are very, very light. There is examples of uh, Svelte application on smart TVs, on um, uh, those devices to pay with your uh, card. I don't know the word in English, uh, payment terminal maybe, uh, which is where the user interface is made with Velt. Uh, uh, the New York Times does all its infographics with Velt uh, because they want to reach a very wide audience uh, all over the world on very low end devices. And if you look at the, the um, charts about coronavirus, which are interactives and so on, and everything is made with felt. 
I really, I've been much more, um, I've took much more time than expected. So yes, I give you a few minutes for questions. Or uh, if there is something you want to check, can be testing, tooling, uh, state management, uh, component tree, uh, practices. Thank Hello. You. So, uh, as I saw, there were a couple of questions. And uh, uh, one cool. of the questions was from uh, Joffre, if I'm saying it correctly. It was about the. Uh, Maybe we will give a, a sound a microphone. Yeah, he said he's, he doesn't like microphones. Yes, yes. Um, Sorry, my microphone is, yeah. Everything in one place? No, it's, it's OK. I, want to try. I got my answer. No, no worries. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you, Jofra. Maybe you can ask the next question, because you said you have some, uh, some no, it's, it's It's good. It's good. Thanks. OK, thank you. For the presentation. OK, cool. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so what Thanks for uh, this presentation. Just a question about mixing React with Svelte together, because <clears throat> in my opinion, Svelte is not that ready for big projects. I would say just for small components which you can inject in something. Have you ever tried to mix these two, let's say, libraries together? So um, uh, that's one of the good parts of Svelte. It's used. Um, I, I don't know why you say it's not ready for a big project. Uh, I think it's just uh, based on some misconception. I, I don't know why, but um, uh, why you, ca you can use it very easily with any other application. Um, why? Because it compiles it directly to a, just a component, which will be a JavaScript class. Uh, I can show you very quickly. Here is a way. Um, uh, this no source. So in my main index.html file, it's how I'm integrating my application. So once compiled, this is belt. Once compiled, it produces. Uh, so you will you can load it that way. Once compiled to JavaScript, you will load app.js or my components.js and then you can say okay my component is a new component target where you append it and you can give the props the properties so if you have defined properties to your component if you so all your components and the component tree will work. If there is some updates to do, it will be updated uh, without any issue. You can have how much you want into an application. Uh, it doesn't change. Just you don't won't have if you have multiple components, they won't be able to to communicate between themselves. So, but since each component can um, on this have events, I haven't shown the events, but you can have trigger custom events from your component. Or if you rely on the global state, like uh, the state I've shown, but other kind of global state management, you can use it inside the component and uh, update your component accordingly. Or for example, here in my component, if I display a change, I can, or, uh, I can, uh, just listen for this event and can trigger the callback. You have uh, an API. There is something else I've never tried. You can compile your component to uh, custom elements. So you compile them to web components. Uh, I know some big project where they are transitioning to that. And to make this transition easiest, they are using uh, web components. So you compile to web components and you register it. And each time you mount a tag with your, uh, it will uh, mount your components the same way. But yes, you can mix them. 
without an issue, you won't have the overhead of the runtime, so you will not have another framework to add on top of it, So, which is good. If you uh, use a runtime framework, you will have to add the 100, 200 kilobytes of code of the other framework into your application. Here, you can mix it that way, OK? So it's very common to do that. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm asking because we had actually the idea to move all our um, uh, components and big projects to a separate repository, let's say, and to import to all new projects because uh, basically the design was kind of the same or a little bit different. Uh, so we can just pass the custom properties to our components. And we were looking for something, and the best was uh, not to use like. Um, native uh, web component, we choose stencil dress but even stencil dress was not the best um yeah because it had some issues with uh, internet explorer for example yes. in chrome if you yes. will have only one render but in internet yes. explorer yes. you will have like 30 renders instantly yeah <clears throat> so that's why we were thinking to write components in svelte but we couldn't, let's say, connect them together normally and to, to pass props and uh, you need to have like special wrapper and all, all such things. And one part what was missing for sure, it was uh, the support of TypeScript. Yes, so for the last one, personally, I don't care at all about TypeScript. So it's not on my uh, radar at all. So, but uh, a lot of people are asking for it. Uh, Svelte is written in TypeScript. You can use it in a TypeScript application, and it should be supported like next release. So I saw the pull request already. Uh, it's a compiler, but uh, it's just an issue because you have to compile it twice or to change completely the compiler, how it works. Because TypeScript is a compiler, Svelte is a compiler, and you need to, uh, you have two targets then. But, uh, they are working on, some users are working on it. Rich Harris, I think, isn't. He don't care either. So, um, uh, but there, there will be some progress for the support of, of TypeScript. Um, it's the same. I'm not sure to understand 100% why it's so important. Because your component, you don't have a lot of logic. And then you can use it in TypeScript. And it could generate a class, so you have even the definition. So yes, I think it's just to check a list, uh, a box on checklist, or to help in IDs for uh, uh, writing applications. But yes, it, it should be coming right soon. So I'm still, I'm already four minutes over the time, so I will let uh, my uh, the other speaker to uh, end over. I will be really happy to answer any question, just contact me. Uh, 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 through the chat or offline after, if you want, right? Okay, thanks a lot, Bertrand. That was really, really cool. I saw other uh, Svelte presentations, but they were more about uh, Hello World applications. And this one uh, I truly enjoyed because I saw things, you know, code, the talk is cheap, show me the code. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Okay, so for the next speaker, we have Thibaut, Thibaut Milan. Thibaut, I'm giving you the um, make, ah, I have to give you the rights. Voila, you can unmute. Sorry, I was misclicking. And um, welcome Thibaut, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. With a divine light uh, in your camera, <laughs> that will be a divine talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I, oh, yeah, that's the one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk about GitHub action tonight, and I will have. Um, I will keep an eye on the discussion. So if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I will be uh, more than happy to uh, to uh, to interact with you live. So 
uh, GitHub action for doing CI, CD, housekeeping, personal assistant, and even your barista. So this evening, we're going to see what CI, CD, just very quickly, because uh, maybe some of you doesn't use it, doesn't know what it can do. So we're going to go through uh, uh, quickly uh, on the, the big pictures. Then we'll see what's GitHub Action and how it's different from uh, a proper CI/CD or existing solution. Then we will have two demonstrations. Um, one, uh, which is uh, based on uh, just uh, like doing housekeeping in a, in a project on the GitHub uh, community. And the second one, which is automating um, the deployment of uh, one of our website in my company, uh, because you know companies sometimes have a uh, um, let's say hard time to trust uh, solutions like uh, Netlify or whatever. So we so sometimes you may face the needs to build some uh, uh, your website uh, on without relying on the third party magical solution. So let's start. Uh, first, I'm Thibaut Milan. I'm an innovation evangelist at Smile. Uh, so it's mostly product or service customers or people in my company to see how to use uh, new technology such as chatbot, machine learning, uh, computer vision, or stuff like that um, in their business and how to prototype around it, how to uh, make new product services. Uh, but um, so it's involved doing a web development of proof of concept. I'm not going until the industrialization stage. We have teams for that and my company. But yeah, you know, you need to uh, show uh, the client some uh, uh, real working stuff. And uh, I worked also with uh, Apple and Adobe uh, in the past and still in the present with Adobe uh, on uh, some very cool projects. So yeah. So what, uh, yeah, so first, uh, just a quick uh, quick run uh, on my company. So it's called Smile. And the motto is IT is open because we are working on uh, open source technology mostly. Uh, and we have four different segments, which is embedded and IoT. So basically just working on uh, gateways, connecting sensor or stuff like that, and uh, doing the industrialization and how you uh, manage all this amount of data. Uh, we made like, for example, a cool uh, electric uh, um, by uh, um, electric um, bike, uh, but powered by sun and with uh, ability to be tracked all around the world. And we made a, a, a work. It was fun. Um, business app, so basically um, like telemed solution or connecting business application together. A digital factory, which is mostly e commerce or uh, B2B, extranet, uh, native uh, mobile application or PWA, and some DevOps and hosting. And I'm part of the um, uh, the innovation team where we try to shake all the company up and put a lot of new and fun things uh, into the different uh, the different offers. So you can check out smile.eu if you want to know more or just come talk to me. Uh, I don't buy it so far. So what's continuous integration and continuous deployment? So basically, it's when the, 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 the paradigm is you can achieve deploying 30 times your application in a day if you want without even noticing it and without your user notice it. Um, so your CI is more like you're building continuously uh, your project without uh, having someone to run manually all the commands and everything, and the testing and asset optimization are also uh, um, automated. So when some of your developers push some code, usually on the master branch or on the develop branch, there's all this uh, process of compiling, testing, doing all the asset optimization automatically for you. So you don't have to do it manually uh, on your computer. Each developer doesn't have to do it. It's a centralized way. It's very efficient if you want to industrialize some process. And the continuous deployment part, the CD part, is like, if all of this working, if the building and the testing goes good, then you can deploy the application. Deploying the application is just not pushing the code. It may be also uh, upgrading uh, your database schema, upgrading some data, killing some uh, virtual machine, or changing completely your infrastructure, because you know some people are doing infrastructure as code. So maybe you just uh, be able to manage your entire infrastructure with uh, 
uh, some uh, definition files and so the uh, continuous deployment will handle the fact that you need to uh, change the your infrastructure basically you have plan code build test release oh i have something wrong so yeah so test release and operate and the ci part is more on this side uh, like more you code then uh, your code is automatically built and automatically tested and if it's fail you have feedback and you can improve this loop and the cd part is more about uh testing doing the release pushing uh so it should be pushing the uh, uh your infrastructure so deploy let's say uh deploy and give you feedback if there's uh, something wrong then uh, you can iterate over that On the tuning side, there's a lot of already existing solutions that are well established and really working good, like Travis CI, CutShip, Team City, uh, Circle CI, Jenkins, GitLab CI, blah blah blah, um, and with a lot of different pricing. Most of them are free for open source project. So if you are your own project and it's open source, you can use it for free. Usually, it comes with no. Um, uh, uh, no SLA, so maybe you will have to wait like 30 minutes to have a slot to be able to uh, build uh, or test, uh, but it's for free, you know, so, right. And uh, obviously, um, there's, uh, there's you, you can buy um, computing time for the solution, and um, it's come then, either you use it uh, on their own platform, so it's a, a service, uh, a software as a service, or uh, you can self-host um, do solution in your own infrastructure if you want, uh, whatever suits you. And there's uh, a couple of standards that uh, arrive at some point, uh, mostly using YAML file to describe the different tasks to run, how to build stuff, how to uh, deploy stuff, how to run your tests, etc. So it's mostly interoperable. So if you want to switch from one solution to another, it's most of the times uh, can be done without any pain and sometimes even without noticing, just like you connect your repository to another tool and that works just well. So um, GitHub Actions is a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit more than just an app. So just not just the, another solution, another new solution. Um, and it can uh, it can connect to um, a lot of these can um, it can do a lot of things related to building uh, your uh, your code or testing or deploying. So if it's more to be seen as um, an automation tool that is built on top of GitHub. So it's available in your repository and it's available for free. So as I said, it's automation, sorry. Um, it's a little less complex than the other tools. So you cannot do as much on uh, the really CI CD part, but as it's very versatile, you can still, uh, for example, define a task that is, I want to run something on uh, Jenkins. So it's totally fine. Uh, it runs on Linux, Mac OS, Windows, ARM, or any container you want. So if you want to have your own uh, container, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's free and unlimited for open source project. Otherwise, a free uh, 2K first minute for your private repository. And uh, you obviously be able to buy more minutes if you need. Um, the little trick is if you run it on Linux, it's like, one minute is one minute, but if you want to run on Mac OS, uh, one running minute on Mac OS is worth three minutes on Linux. So it's not really the same. Uh, the pricing is a little bit uh, different based on if you want to run it uh, on the different OS. There's a huge community of already pre-made action, which are really, really uh, easy to use, out of the box, and really easy to customize. We will see it later. So it's very convenient if you are kind of new on uh, the CI/CD things, or if just like me, you never really uh, take the time to dig into detail. Uh, that's really cool because uh, it, it's really easy to use, and it's uh, there's a lot of privacy by design uh, or uh, 
around this solution. So everything is run into a secure environment. There's no um, access to this running environment. Um, so there's some trick uh, to, uh, to to deal with if you want to uh, uh, extract some data from this running environment, or if you want to include some data that are not already in your repository. We will see that. And it's can uh, used on a language. So basically, if you can run a binary on Linux or Mac OS or Windows, well, you can just use it. Any questions so far? Or I start with the first demonstration. Okay, so this first demo is a little uh, project that has a little bit of age, so that's why I see this dependabot alert, which is now based, uh, which is now uh, something based on um, automation on GitHub Actions, which is cool. Um, so you find all the action in these uh, tabs on your project. And as you can see, I already have some uh, existing stuff. So I, uh, here you have your different workflow you created. So you have um, you, you have the possibility to run a, a workflow on uh, different uh, events. So on a code push, for example, or just on uh, when there's a new peer submitted to uh, another, uh, a new push re um, a pull release. Um, uh made on your uh, on your repository or if you are making a new release or if there's a new comment or if there anything so you can define the different workflow and those different workflow files will be executed based on uh, the event you define so here i have uh, three of them uh, which are mostly uh, housekeeping uh, is it possible to build an ios app on macOS through github action uh Yes, because you can manipulate Xcode with um, the command line interface. So if you can build it with the command line interface, that's fine. Yeah, you can do it. But Xcode is not very, um, I don't find it very user friendly in command line interface. I prefer to use it with a, a UI, a real a proper UI. So yeah, it can be done, but I will not like to do it myself. But yeah, you can. Um, so the, the the different things I made. The first things uh, I made on this uh, repository, since it's a little bit, we have uh, using an action to mark stale issues or pull requests. So how does it look? It's very very easy. So it's a file living in the .github repository and in the workflow repository inside of that, and then you can have the name of you want. You can name it anything .yml. Uh, inside of it, I just put uh, a real name, that uh, a proper description, which is shown here. So it's more convenient in the web interface for me to uh, just look at it. And for this one, I don't use a, a proper event, but I want to run it as scheduled because I want to do some uh, tilling of my repository. So uh, I run it every day. And then I have a job definition, which is the name of the only job here, which is tail. I said I want to run on Ubuntu, Ubuntu latest, which is a default Linux distribution available. And there's a few steps. Oh, and this one is just one step. For my job, a job can have multiple steps. We will show an example later. So the only steps is uh, closing the stale issues. And for that, I use an action which is already existing and already made by someone else, which is stale. And I can put, with the wheel argument, I can put several uh, parameters. So I just copy-paste the, um, the default one. So I pass my repo token, which is needed for this uh, automation to be run. Then I can have this uh, stale issue message, and I can uh, change. I have also I can also put a, a different message for the PR, and I define uh, the different days I want before marking it stale, and then before marking it closed. So as you, as you can see, uh, I wait sixty days um, before marking uh, before pushing a message that. Uh, this issue is stale, it will be closed in 30 days. And then I wait 30 days more and I close the issue. 
And so yes, this file uh, is in the repository um, exactly. Uh, this is stale.yml, not the labeler.yml. We will see the labeler just after that. Uh, and you can manage the secret inside of your settings here. You are inside of your repository settings, you can manage the secret here and you can define all the secrets you want. So for example, if you need, um, so the, the token secret is already uh, automatically created. You don't have to create it. And you can have secret per organization, which is kind of cool. Uh, if you want to define uh, like your AWS uh, F3 uh, token, for example, for your entire team, you can put it here. Or if it's per repository, you can create it per repository. Uh, we will see it uh, on the second demonstration where I pushing uh, stuff uh, on AWS. I use it a lot because I need a, a user, then I need uh, my token, then I need uh, some other stuff. So I define in depth and then I can use it uh, inside of my automation. And when you define uh, a secret, well, it's a secret, so you're not able to see it anymore. You just see the variable here, so you can copy paste it uh, easily, but that's it. If you want to uh, redefine your secret, you have to delete it and create it again. Uh, the second one I can show you is a labeler, which works not that, uh, not that well, as you can see. So. Yeah, in the in the interface, you can see all the workflow, and you can click on a, a specific workflow, and you see how much time it took so the last uh, uh, the, the last run, and uh, if it goes well, and if you click on it, you have the details of the action. So um, it generates the artifacts, the annotation. The job is complete. I can see the workflow fine, which I just show you, and I can go on the details here, and I can see the different uh, steps. So I can see that the setup jobs works well. I see also the action runs quite well, and the secrets in the log are secrets, obviously. So that's also a really nice feature. For example, if you uh, your action do some echoes of your secrets, automatically, automatically um, the runner match the secret with all the secret defined, uh, the, the, set, the, um, the string of your secret with all the secrets defined in your repository, and it automatically removes it from the log, which is really, really nice because I saw some very catastrophic stuff happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the first one, which automatically close all uh, the issues and the pull request after some time. So if I check on my issues and I check on the You can see it's Maca stale because I uh, in the action I want to use this um, um, this uh, this label, and if you go on the details, you see that my GitHub action put a message after some time and a label, and then it closes the issue automatically. If we are going back uh, on the actions. So the first thing for me is uh, if I want to do some TD is uh, to automate uh, peer or issue message, which is already cool, or always cool. If you go on github.com slash marketplace slash actions, uh, or if you just look for actions uh, on, uh, on GitHub, you see that there's a lot uh, of already made action in a lot of different uh, sections. Some of them are verified by um, uh, by GitHub, and they have this little uh, this little mark, so they are safe to use. And there are some that can be also um, not free to use because they are interactives with interacting with some uh, server outside or whatever. So, for example, this action I use is auto message uh, for Pierre, and when I want to use it, I just have to see copy paste here in my file in my uh, my workflow file. I want to use and just follow the instruction here. Or the other things I can do is here, when I create a new workflow, it's open automatically uh, a, a view which uh, offers me some default workflows that can uh, uh, I would like. So for example, Terraform, you know, if I want to manage my uh, my infrastructures, or I want to deploy my Node.js app to Azure Web App Apps, or I want to deploy to ECS, or just a simple stuff like just setting up uh, Rust or setting up Ruby and being able to do some commands, or having uh, this uh, Jekyll uh, builder already uh, ready to use. 
that can be nice. Or I can just go with a, a simple workflow and I can, for example, if I want, that's the style um, action I, I use. And when I click on set up this workflow, it automatically creates a file for me with a name. So I will not be able to do that because obviously I already have uh, this, uh, this file, but I can have something different. I have the editors. Uh, with uh, color syntax, which is cool. I already have uh, everything copy-paste, so it's free to use. Here I can access the documentation, so it's all, all, also nice to see the documentation on the, how workflow uh, is working. And um, here you see you have some very useful tooltips that explain you the syntax, so it's uh, really nice. And if you start, um, I think some stuff you uh, you were able to uh, to see some uh, for example it's a complete job ID so I can do a new job ID and then um, the test and when I come here I start putting like runs whoops runs on and it automatically recognize and try to do some validation so it's really useful uh, you can do it everything online and you can do it obviously on your own. Uh, on your own uh, computer and then push uh, push to your repository and here you have the marketplace you find again so uh, for example if i if i didn't have all of this already made and i just want to add a, a new job or just a new step uh, on my uh, my workflow because uh, i'm fine to run that uh, every day at uh, 1 30 i can search here and say i want uh, to have let's say this action to be used, and then I see the action and all of the details. And I can just select copy and then just can paste here, then uh, if I want to use it. So it's really convenient. Uh, I find it. So some uh, some ideas you can do uh, for starting with uh, GitHub Action. So auto message for peer issues, marking issues as tells. I also do some labels, so it's basically a triage uh, on my issues. So what I do is I try to, um, so that's also uh, an action made by GitHub. So every, uh, the organization is called action on GitHub. So it's uh, the, all the actions made on GitHub are in this organization name and um, the uh, repository is labeler and I want the V2. And basically this one is a little bit uh, tricky because you just, as you can see, Uh, the GitHub token, which is needed to be able to access my repository. And you may see, oh, that's that's it, that's weird. But if you go to see the documentation, they said you need to create uh, another file, which is the configuration. And they said you have to put it into the GitHub folder, into, so in the workflow, you have all your YAML workflow, but here it's, the labeler.yml, which is a configuration file. And in this configuration file, basically I said, um, if you look on uh, the structure here, you see that there's uh, an API folder, an app folder, a container folder, and a UI folder. And which I define here is to say, okay, if it's in UI, either the file into UI or any subfolder of UI, I want to put the label front end. And if it's in API, any file in, uh, in the folder API or any file in the subfolder of API, I want to put the API label on my uh, my pull request or on my issues. And I'm not sure, yeah, it works. So for example, here you see there's a pull request uh, on the UI and the bot automatically put uh, the front end uh, label uh, on it. And the last things I did on this repository in terms of uh, quick stuff is uh, to create uh, a little welcomer. So I made a little action, which is just say uh, to anyone that submitted a new PR uh, on my folder uh, on this project, say, hi, uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, so far we are a little bit low in, uh, um, in manpower to be able to look at your, uh, to review your PR, but, uh, please uh, keep it on. We will come uh, 
uh, we will come after a, a couple of uh, of days and uh, review it so it's another another very easy to use file so i i create this greeting.yml and you see it's run on pull request and on issues so when there's something happening on issues and something happening on pull request it's run uh, my job is just named uh, hello new contributors in run our new boot uh, latest just like the other one and the only step is using the first interaction action and putting a an issue message and a PR message, uh, which is fine, basically. That's it. Uh, I will give you some little view on other nice stuff you can uh, check if you want to start with automation on your repository. For example, creating a release is always fine because as you may have uh, noticed when you're creating a new tag, which is called, for example, v1 or v1 point whatever, uh, it's not create a release inside of uh, GitHub. It creates a new tag, which uh, which at some point I think uh, you saw them. You you was able before to saw them like uh, uh, as a as kind of a release. So you you will see, for example, a tag, uh, a new tag, or a new iteration of the tag. But it's not a release per se. It's not do. Uh, uh, GitHub doesn't provide automatically the, uh, the zip file or the tar JZ file. Um, so you may want to say, for example, if I have a new um, a, a new tag, which start with V dash or just V, well, I want to create automatically uh, a new release, a new proper release on um, on GitHub. And, to, and I want a custom message uh, that uh, you can totally uh, construct from uh, the aggregation on uh, of all the uh, either what you put on the tag or either aggregate information from uh, the different commits whatsoever so that's another thing which is cool i want to use that uh, one day and the other one for a big project when you are using uh, issues on github uh, which is really really nice is to be able to do like epic issues on GitHub. So it's already also based on automation. And the thing is you can create an issue where you reference other issues. And when you are closing these other issues, it's automatically check uh, and update this epic issue for you. So you don't have to do anything. It's just like, well, when there's new issue created, open, closed, reopen, deleted, it's going to automatically go through all um, the different epic issues, try to find and reopen whatsoever, and update uh, the, uh, the checkbox uh, automatically, either checking or unchecking. So it's kind of cool. I really like this one. I want to try it because uh, uh, it's all, also always a little bit difficult when, um, when you are using uh, GitHub for also project management because you have just all those different issues. And then they introduced a few times ago, which is a project, which is basically like a Kanban uh, for your project. You can define uh, V0, V1, V2, uh, whatever. And then you can assign the different issues into it. And you have this to do in progress done, which is nice to have. But when you are doing very high level uh, issues, then referencing all the different issues and managing all of that and updating everything can be a little bit difficult to do by hand. So this kind of automation is very, very welcome. That's the end for my first demonstration. Uh, I can go now on the second one, uh, which is building and deploying your entire Jekyll website. And I made a typo, fine, in AWS. Any question? for the moment, or should we go to the second demonstration? OK, let's go to the second one. Oh, OK, yeah, tell me. Well, yeah, that's that's kind of possible. You, so you don't install GitHub Action on your own infrastructure, but if you want, you can have your own runner. So you can say, I don't want to run it on uh, uh, on Mac OS. I don't want to run it on uh, Ubuntu latest. I want to connect my own infrastructures to be able to have the runners uh, running my code on my own infrastructures.
Yeah, that's true. It's not included um, into GitHub Enterprise. They have a special plan uh, if you want to use it so far. Uh, but if you're using GitHub Enterprise, I think you're entitled to some uh, credits already existing. Guys, you can ask uh, maybe questions even by voice or we can... Yeah, I can read it. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. So, uh, yes, yeah, the first question is, uh, is it included into uh, GitHub Enterprise? So, uh, no. And uh, the other question was, uh, can I install GitHub Action in my own infra? So, no, you can, can't install it on your own infrastructure, but you can have the runner run inside your own infrastructure if you want. And as I said, uh, if you uh, if you have a GitHub Enterprise, it's not uh, actions doesn't comes with GitHub Enterprise, but you have credits that you can use uh, on your project, which are on GitHub.com, which is not really likely to happen. But I think they're working on uh, on some things to be able to integrate it more. But the, the the difficult part is everything is running in secure environment and being able to run the secure environment on the, the client's infrastructure is a little bit tricky. And Alain asked, uh, the idea is to reuse as much as possible actions from the marketplace and then develop your own as much as possible. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> I would say that uh, if you find something that works for you, that's already uh, cool to, uh, uh, that's that always good to, uh, to use something that have uh, maybe even 20 people working on contributing on an action. Uh, is uh, maybe better than just you building your own action, but it's not that difficult to build your own action if you want. I and mean, you can, every, anyone can publish uh, their own action on the marketplace, and you can choose it to do it for free, or you can uh, choose to monetize them if you want. It's not already invented here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, uh, the second demonstration, well, that's a nice uh, transition, Alain, because uh, you will see I had a, quite a struggle doing uh, uh, finding the right action that can do what I want to do here. But I come with, uh, I think, uh, at this time, a nice uh, walk around. You know, there's a lot of uh, it, it evolved very also with you. Uh, um, what I made on this uh, this uh, this different action and uh, what can be done now uh, based on uh, the the evolved technology. So basically, it's just a Jekyll website. I use Forestry for having a nice uh, uh, administration interface. If you're doing Jekyll website and you want uh, a nice uh, interface for your end user to uh, to write stuff on your website, you can use Forestry.io. It's free. Uh, until you want some very fancy features. They didn't try a lot to monetize it. They are really cool guys. And uh, yeah, you can build uh, interface, uh, editing interface very quickly and for free. So, and you can connect it to your GitHub repository and it, it will create all the files for you and it will be able to edit the files. Uh, because I have real users that I don't know how to do even a Markdown file with uh, the front matter, so yeah. Um, so, uh, so my users can be able to put uh, the different content inside of this repository, and then it needs to be built at some point because it doesn't live on uh, Netlify, which automatically build and uh, expose the website for you. And we're already having an AWS S3 uh, account that we want to use. Because it's a Jekyll website, I can just push my file on S3, and uh, then uh, it will be available. If I want to use HTTPS, I need to put code front in front of it to be able to take my file from S3, then serve them uh, with HTTPS, with a certificate, and export them to the outside. But if you don't want, I don't know why you don't want to do that, but if you don't want HTTPS, you can just have the S3 directly. So let's see how uh, I did it. So I go to my actions, and I have my first action, which is Jekyll site build and AWS deploy. And if I open this file, and if I check uh, on the uh, on this file, um, so uh, I have the same name that you've seen already before, and I want that to be run only when I push on master. 
So if uh, because if some people push on uh, another branch, I don't want to push an update on my uh, production website. And I have several jobs here. So my first is the candidate build. So because of my website is made of two parts. So I have my Jekyll website, which is not very, um, if we go, we can see uh, it's innovation.smile.u. So if we go on the website, we see that there's a public part and there's also a React application, which is uh, uh, a private uh, private sections, which is behind uh, a, a single authentication from my company. So this is a React application, and this is the Jekyll rendering. So I need the two of them to be built at the same time when I want to push some content. So that's why I have first the um, the, the web application made. So basically, what it's done, uh, it runs on Ubuntu same and first i install my deploy key so this is uh, a simple action which is taking a secret and register the secret which is my ACH key inside of the uh, container session uh, to be able to use this ACH key then i have another step which is scan uh, the host key from uh, my uh, from the, the the git repository because this project is not on GitHub, it's on, on our private uh, GitLab. So I do a SSH key scan to be able to uh, get the uh, the, um, the signature and add it to the new host. Then I clone the repository from our uh, internal uh, Git. Then after that, I run the uh, build on NPM. So I browse on, so I just run here, you can see, here I, I'm running, uh, for example, here, you see I'm using uh, directly another action, and sometimes I just run command, uh, command line. So here, for example, I just do SSH key scan. Here I just do git clone. I don't use an action to do a git clone. I can just really use commands. And if I want to, uh, to use uh, multiple commands, I can just use the pipe here and put So just after, then I do the npm install. Then I define some um, some uh, variable, and then I do the npm run build. When I did all of this, I have my web application which is built. But that's it. I don't have the uh, other things, and I need after this job. If I just exit this job, everything that I created inside of this job is trashed. So I need to put it on some space that I can retrieve after. And that's why I use the upload artifact. So the upload artifact is an action where you said, OK, I want this folder to be uploaded in a temporary uh, area with this name. And that's it. So with, the, with this name, sorry. So with the contribute app name, I want this folder to be uh, taken and put it apart, which will enable me then after to uh, use a download artifact action to be able to retrieve that and use it inside another step. So my second step is the build step, which runs also on Ubuntu. And um, then I have uh, my my second, uh, sorry, my second job, which have multiple steps first. I use the checkout action, which is a basic action where I want to uh, get the uh, the working um, the working directory. So I want the last uh, the last uh, master commit uh, the last commit on master branch on my project. Then I set up uh, Ruby to be able to build my website, and then uh, I just uh, run some uh, basic script action, which is. Uh, the gem install bundler, then I uh, bundle, uh, I do a bundle install, then I do the, bu the bundle exact Jekyll build. After that, uh, I have my Jekyll website, which is built inside of uh, underscore sites. And uh, I want uh, to uh, 
to upload also the art this artifact. So this generated site, I want to upload, upload it somewhere to be able to use it later. So I just use the same action, upload artifact. And I said, this folder, I want to be referred by this name. And the last actions is the deploy itself. So the deployment itself, uh, I needs, and here that's something new, uh, because all the uh, jobs uh, can be run in parallel. So if you want at some point some uh, um, some uh, some jobs to be done and wait for them, you can use the needs instruction. So I said I need the build job, which is the first one, and I need also the candidate build uh, to be done before running this um, this job. And in this job, uh, just add the other one. It's running on a Ubuntu latest. And the steps are, are pretty, ba pretty basic. So first, I download uh, the website I made. So I use the download artifact. And I want the generated site uh, key, I would say. Uh, and I want to put it in, uh, in my uh, just the folder where I am. Then I do the same things with the React application. But this time, I want to put it in the candidate subfolder. And finally, uh, I'm doing, uh, I'm using the action S3 sync actions with some arguments. So basically here, I just follow the sim links and I want to delete all the uh, old stuff. So I will re-upload everything once again, which is, I know, not really uh, efficient. Uh, but since when you're building your jQuery website, sometimes maybe you remove some content. And if you don't use that, all those old content will stay inside of your S3 folder uh, while you are coding. So it's kind of tricky. So I prefer to uh, delete everything every time, and then we upload a fresh copy. And here, you can see some interesting things. Uh, I used different secret that I defined myself, which is my AWS S3 bucket. So then the, the bucket name, the key ID, and the access key are uh, secrets that I define in, my, uh, in this repository. I also be able to define the region, the source director or the destination director, which I don't use, it's optional. Um, don't forget to define your region because if uh, just like us, you're using a Euro region and not the US region and you uh, forget to do that, by default it's a US East one region. So then you end like... And that's it for the file. So it's a, a little more tricky of file, but as you can see, just like three different jobs with the last job that needs uh, the, uh, the two other jobs to be done before running. And uh, all the different jobs are uh, after multiple steps that runs one by one. If I look, uh, if I look here, I see my three different jobs, and I can inspect the two, the three different jobs to see how it runs. So for example, this job, first you set up the uh, the running environment, so the container basically with uh, my uh, my uh, my Linux distribution. Then I run the install the deploy key and I can see the uh, what's happened inside of the, the deploy key. As you can see, my SSH key here, even in the log, uh, is, uh, is removed uh, just for your security. Then I scan my for host key, then I clone my repository, then I build with NPM, so ooh, shit load of stuff. Then uh, I upload my artifact. I can see how much uh, file and the size and everything. And that's the same for building the Jekyll website. I can see all the uh, different steps. Uh, so it's very convenient because if you have some issues at some point, you can really see live where the issue is. And my deploy to AWS also. <clears throat> When I did, uh, when I do all of that, something happening is I creating a lot of artifacts. And artifacts are files that, if I if I take for example this build, this action, oh, it's a little bit long. So you see, I have two minutes running uh, for my action every time between two or three minutes, which is fine. So my three jobs are complete in two minutes uh, fifteen seconds. And well, here you don't see any artifact because I have another um, uh, another uh, action 
that are removing them. But otherwise, you would have seen here all the different artifacts that are generated and stored here. And you have a limited element uh, of free space to store your artifact. So I didn't want to hit, at some point, this uh, limit and start having to pay for that. So which I did is to create another action, which is just, from time to time, scan all the um, all the actions and delete the old artifact, and that's it. So if I see the workflow file, it's yeah and there. So I run it from time to time. So it's run every day at uh, 8 p.m. And what I do is just like uh, removing all the artifacts that are generated than uh, more than seven days ago. Doing so, I know that my uh, uh, my repository will not hit the limit, and I will not have to pay. Uh, when I created all of the, those different actions, that was the only way to uh, be able to pass um, code or generated stuff or whatsoever between the different uh, session, the different job, because the job is just like something that will be uh, completely disappear at the end of the job. So that was the only way to be able to action stuff. Uh, just a little, uh, some days after uh, I created the, this, uh, this different file, they introduced something which is uh, being able to pass a variable. Uh, so you can pass text or output of text whatsoever between uh, between the different jobs, which is fine, but I can use it because I want to pass the entire uh, website generated uh, every time. Um, and since I don't know when, I think it's uh, one month ago, they introduced um, cache, which is an action that where you able to put some code and it's cache for this workflow running. So if your workflow require several jobs, exchanging information, exchanging code, exchanging generated content, um, you can put it in a cache and the cache disappear at the end of the workflow, which is very convenient. I need to redo my file to use that. And then I will be able to get rid of my workflow, which is just uh, do garbage collecting. And yeah, that's it for the uh, last demonstration. So, oh, oh yeah, I have a question from Anna. What's my experience of the reliability of jobs run by GitHub with we used on AWS in the end? Um, well, the only very frustrating things is the only issue I had is when you have, um, for example, uh, when you're running some jobs which for some reason are stuck, it's really difficult to be able to cancel a job. So the web interface is not well made to be able to cancel a job. And if you have a, if you have an error and you are in your file and then someone push a lot of uh, content, then you you quickly became uh, uh, having like uh, 20 or 30 instance of the same workflow, which uh, cause uh, issues running and running and running. Uh, so you have then uh, 20 or 30 very complex navigating through uh, the different uh, action running to be able to cancel it, then wait a little bit that uh, your, uh, your, your, uh, your request of cancellation is taken into account. So it can continue your credit very, uh, very quickly. Uh, but that's uh, that's it. Otherwise, uh, for in, in terms of performance, in terms of uh, building and be able to uh, uh, to use it, it's quite uh, quite effective. Um, the building time is really nice, and if you want to run stuff, it's uh, I mean it's not on uh, on cheap uh, specification, so it's run quite quickly. Um, uh, sometimes uh, more efficiently than on my own computer when I want to uh, to compile some uh, some application. Um, the connectivity with uh, external services is good. Um, the, the only thing is maybe when you are doing uh, some automation around your um, your uh, your repository, your uh, your GitHub uh, project, uh, you want that to be run like instant, and sometimes it takes like maybe one minute or two to run. So, for example, the labelers, um, if you want to automate your triage, it's not instant. 
the the, the it needs like maybe maybe two minutes to start then you need to set up the environment to be able to run uh, your action so it's uh, it takes maybe uh, two or three minutes so Geoffrey shared that on the action five zero and 320 action in five months and it recall well three of the errors were on the side of the tips yeah the chrome tiger uh yeah sometimes they it takes a, a little bit of time to to do so uh my, the last uh, the last thing is for uh, uh because on the title i said that it can be your own barista so yeah it can obviously uh, if, for example, you have this very fancy Siemens machine, which costs you like uh, 8K euro, I think, you will have an API that you can uh, trigger any uh, anytime, and you can just do a curl to uh, this API to be able to trigger uh, your coffee uh, when your test pass or when you're putting something uh, in production. So definitely you can, uh, technically, uh, with uh, AFTTT or uh, other stuff like that on GitHub, uh, have some fun to uh, to automate these kind of things also. Um, well, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any other uh, any other question you may have. If you want to find me, uh, there's my website, my email, and my Twitter account. And if you have any question whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> I would like to automate uh, my coffee at work, but unfortunately, they don't. Uh, they don't took my request to buy an 8k euro uh, coffee machine just for a team of three people. I don't know why. That's a shame. If you want. Thank you, Thibault, for your talk. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and I heard that tomorrow you have a birthday. Yeah. Oh, congrats! Woo! Thank you. <laughs> and um, I wish you a good uh, celebration tomorrow. Yeah, thanks. I already um, told my God that I'm not going to go to work because that's against my religion to work on my birthday. <laughs> uh, it was good talk, interesting, uh, quite useful. And uh, I think that you read already almost all questions. But guys, if you still have questions, you can ask them by voice in, in this talk. <laughs> They are happy for your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, guys, you still can ask uh, questions. Um, the boy on Twitter later, and uh, I remind you that next meetup we have uh, it's on five fifth uh, of uh, of August. We have two talks: one about CSS from Geoffrey, and another uh, about. Um, background services from Maxim Salnikov uh, from another country, Norway. And um, what else? I remind you to go to the page of Meetup uh, uh, of this event and to uh, send us uh, your feedback. Uh, how was it? Was it interesting? Was it good? And maybe you can yes, help uh, us to improve our online Meetups. And uh, hope to see you someday in real life. And thank you, everyone, that you were with us today. Yeah, and register to, to next meetup. Okay, thank you, guys. Bye.